computer. Okay. Okay. Last night I got a bit of a surprise when I was doing a press yeah. conference with Rug <laughs> Rugby Atlanta because they did it live on Facebook and it, and it said, um, you authorize us to record you? I'm like, no one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you for accepting to do this uh, uh, for us, uh, Chris. Um, as I posted on LinkedIn, Christine is a young, enthusiastic a person from Namibia and who's accepted to do a virtual internship. Unfortunately, uh, it has to be virtual because we couldn't bring her over from Namibia to Switzerland because of all the travel restrictions. But um, we, we've been trying to make it as um, real as possible. Uh, as I did also mention that uh, she's studying communication and the idea was to get her as much as possible exposed to people who are doing work uh, to do with Africa. Mm -hmm. And from where we come from, uh, the Jobs of Africa Foundation is about empowering young people throughout the continent, uh, through job creation, skills development, and above all, entrepreneurship. Well, so we view... You just hit on the three things Africa desperately needs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, we view mentorship as very important also, because we want to learn from, we don't like saying old people, but we want to learn from people with a lot of experience. Uh, do you mean, do you people mean... who have traveled throughout the world, Maybe it means seasoned, got... seasoned people. <laughs> yes, seasoned people. People who have traveled throughout the world and who have got a thing or two to share with the young people so that they don't, you know, make the same mistakes. You know, they are always very enthusiastic. They want to try several things. Uh, but it's always good to tell them, look, this has been tried before. It never worked. Mm -hmm. So this is supposed to be uh, Christine's uh, show, actually. I'm just there to introduce her. Mm -hmm. And then I will leave you to have, you know, uh, a conversation. And uh, it is part of our onboarding so that she can represent the organization. But what I can say, Chris, maybe sometimes, I know you've been uh, very active with your Idaba Africa we can probably, you know, try to get another session where we can talk more and and see how we can build synergies. Absolutely. And uh, if you're interested, um, I do interviews. Before YouTube censored me, I did over 300 interviews uh, in nine months on my channel. And so mm -hmm. I try to interview people of interest from all over the continent and those that deal with the continent. I've done, um, you know, people that no one's ever heard of, like Dax, who's a Tswana speaking panel beater who became an artist and took a risk. And yeah. he, was, he became successful. And then the lockdown messed up his business and small scale uh, commercial farmers in Ghana, regional security mm -hmm. experts, people like mm -hmm. Steve Holfmeyer in South yeah. Africa, politicians. Yeah. So if you're interested, maybe we can do an interview and talk about what you guys do, because it might interest folks. We could do that sometime. Yeah, definitely. OK, so um, Christine, uh, as I said, it's your show. You are in very good hands. <laughs> so. Uh, as I told you, it's going to be soft. Chris is a very nice person, very passionate. We've been connected for quite some time. He likes my things. I like his things. So <laughs> so um, I'll leave you, and then you will tell me how it goes. And then Chris will connect later. All is right. that okay? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Frederick. Okay. All the best. All right. Okay, now it's just the two okay. of us. Okay. Let, let, me so take, let, me, let me take my earpiece out and see how it sounds, okay? Okay, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, but it's really echoing my room. Um, I need to put, hang on a second. Let me just put the earpiece back in. I had little earbuds like you've got, but um, I kept breaking the tips on them. So, so I switched to this. This is, uh, anyway, all right. So uh, it's your show. How can I help you? Perfect. Okay, so first of all, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, I'm representing Jobs for Africa Foundation today, as Frederick has already told you. 
And I just wanted to ask you a few questions. First of all, please tell us about yourself, and your experience. What institutions have you worked for? Sure. Well, that that's a long that's a long journey. I'll try to keep it as condensed as possible. Of course, I'm an American, and uh, I was uh, born uh, at a time when America started changing very much for the better. The civil rights legislation had just been enacted just before my birth, and uh, I've had a very interesting experience in life. All sorts of different childhood experiences. I lived in 34 of our lower 48 states and attended 38 elementary and junior high schools. Uh, fortunately, I managed to stay in just a single high school for my last four years, which is amazing in itself. Uh, and I lived in all sorts of circumstances, lived in abject poverty, uh, lived in public assistance, lived in upper middle class circumstances, lived in places where, for instance, I lived in a housing project in Maryland. There were 300 families, three of them were white. So all of my neighbors were black. So I was very much a minority. I know what that experience was like. Uh, I um, also lived in uh, in a very poor part of Buffalo, New York for a while, in which I went to a primary school and nobody spoke English except me. It was America in the 19, early 1970s. And I was the only student who spoke English. They were all Puerto Ricans. Um, and uh, I've also went to a high school in a county in rural, <clears throat> excuse me, rural Appalachia, where all the students were white just because other folks were smart enough not to live in a depressed economic area, I guess. Uh, and then I went to university at age 17 uh, on a full uh, grants from the state and federal government, plus a student loan, and I worked. But I really wasn't prepared for school. I had um, spent my high school years running a small dairy farm, and uh, which I didn't own, but I, I ran it. And then um, I, uh, yeah, well, it, it wasn't ours. <laughs> it was, well, it was my stepfather's, it wasn't mine. But um, the reason I mentioned not owning is that as I came time to graduate from high school and what I was going to do in life, I, I owned no land. I had no money. I was not a particularly strong student in high school because I was busy at five o'clock every morning milking cows and at night. So, you know, I wasn't really applying myself in high school. I was smart enough, but not not achieving the grades. I mean, I wasn't terrible, but I was just not a top student. So I was uh, above average, but not great. And so I didn't own land. I didn't have any money. Um, I didn't have money to go to university at first, but then I was mentored by a couple of really good high school teachers who just took a few minutes of their time now and then just asked me what I was going to do, encouraged me to go to university. They said, you're pretty smart. You should go to university. I'm like, but I haven't got any money. Go to the guidance counselor's office. You can find out about loans and grants. And sure enough, that's all it took was that little spark. So I, I went to school for a year and I really wasn't ready for it. And so I left after a year and I joined the army, which was my ultimate goal all along. I wanted to become a leader and I wanted to serve the army because I was deeply patriotic and I thought I could give back to society. I never was certain whether I'd make a career of it, but that began a 36 and a half year journey, 34 year of the, those years on active duty and two, year, two and a half years in the reserve component, including two years in the Ohio National Guard. I came in the army in 83 and got out in 87, went back to university, finished my degree with high honors and then came back in as an intelligence officer just before the Gulf War started, went to the Gulf War. And over that time in the army, I spent three tours in Germany, one in Italy, and then in Africa, I was stationed in Tunisia, Liberia, Botswana, Malawi, Niger, Mauritania, Uganda, and Ethiopia, where I worked at the African Union. Did peacekeeping, I developed HIV programs. Uh, I also did Ebola research, tuberculosis, malaria. Um, trained uh, African soldiers in professionalism, respect for civil authority. And also, we did um, all, all sorts of things, multinational exercises, counterterrorism, peacekeeping, all that. And um, along the way, when I was at university the first time, I wound up going at a, a sort of a hobby to work at a radio station. That was one of the things available to students. They Each of the greens, the, the residential areas, they're called greens because they have lawns, so they call them greens. Um, I guess it's an old English thing, but anyway, so I lived on the East screen and they had a radio station and you could go there and learn how to use the studio and, and, and be a, a disc jockey. So I did that. And now it didn't go out over the air. It was just over what we call carrier wave. So it was transmit over the power lines in the house through the mains. So you plug in your radio and it comes through the power, not through the airways. So it's always got a buzz on it, but it, but it was interesting. And that way they could be licensed because you go through the airwaves, you have to be licensed by the federal government. So uh, that was my first interest in broadcasting. And I started doing that. And then throughout my career, of course, as an intelligence officer and analyst, I wrote a lot. So my writing skills, if, if they were always pretty good, but they came quite exceptional as a consequence of all that experience. And so I took that and began writing a few articles about national security and about rugby, which I'm passionate about. You can see I'm wearing a Velvicious shirt right here from the 2019 Rugby World Cup. A big fan. Um, Jacques Borg is one of my favorite players of all time, as is Kies Lenzi. But anyway, so I um, so I decided to start doing that towards the end of my career. But while I was serving in Africa, we never had the media people 
that we needed to, you know, get stories out about what we we're doing positively across Africa. And I thought that was important. Strategic communications, as we call it, although that's a term that's fallen in disfavor, is really important from my viewpoint. Um, if strategic communications is influencing others outside your own country about what you're trying to do and, when, and also dispel rumors about it. So I felt that to be critically important. And that also when I was in Liberia rebuilding the army, the Chinese were always trying to find out what we're doing. And so I made it easy on them. I just told them. <laughs> and here they thought they were clever. Their intelligence officer would go back and go, Whoa, I got this from the Americans. Yeah, well, of course you did. We want you to know what's going on. We don't want you to think there's anything wrong going on here. But uh, I started doing um, writing articles for US Africa Command and for journals. And then um, I had been an undergraduate teacher at Iowa State University in uniform and then a postgraduate uh, instructor at a um, master's branding institution, U.S. Army War College. And I began writing there again for publication. So I'm published in commercial circles for sports, uh, also for um, for academic articles, as well as uh, in, um, in in books and such. You know, these are my two most recent books where I've contributed to uh, books uh, published by the War College and one published by Stellenbosch University just came out in February. So I uh, published author, radio personality, television personality. I've done interviews in English, German, and French. Uh, when I was in West Africa, I'd be interviewed all the time in French. So yeah, um, I have um, been an intelligence officer, tactical, counterintelligence agent, a signals intelligence officer, a strategic intelligence officer, and then a regional specialist for Sub-Saharan Africa. I've worked at the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the US Africa Command, the Pentagon, U.S. Army War College, and then I've worked with non-government organizations all over Africa and the world. I've worked with corporations. I've had corporations work for me. I've run $3 billion programs at the National Security Agency. So it's pretty pretty cool ride, and I've been to the last six Rugby World Cups. <laughs> I hope that helps a little bit. Oh, that's an important one to add, the one about the rugby. I then also just wanted to ask you something more about, can you tell us more about Indaba Africa? Sure. What that is, is I, I learned a very valuable lesson as a young officer. I was deployed to Israel for four months in the early 1990s after the Gulf War. And I was there as the intelligence officer for a task force that was there to do what we call gunnery. Um, you can't fire missiles in Germany, obviously, because people live there and there's no place to fire missiles from helicopters, but that's training that's necessary. It can be done in Crete, but it's very complicated. Uh, Israel made an offer to us, uh, I think because they're concerned about the Gulf War being so recent. And so we went down there to uh, to Israel and we used their ranges, lots of space and, and fired all these helicopter battalions came down. So I was intelligence officer. I had to create the scenario because there has to be a fictional enemy you can chase. So I thought I was being clever and I took the map of Israel and the region. I made little countries and, and I made one of the countries I called Bulawayo. And uh, one of our one of our officers, obviously Bulawayo in, in Zimbabwe, one of our uh, officers who's from the deep south um, would have a hard time with it. Right, so Ted Wyatt, this uh, Bulawayo, uh, he had a real hard time saying it. So I realized that if you want people to learn words from somewhere else, you don't want to give them four syllables or more. It just becomes too complicated. So what I did is when I was approaching retirement, people asked me, are you going to work at the War College? And I said, I'm tired of bureaucracy. Why would I want to do that as a civilian? And they're like, what are you going to do? Are you Are going to sit around and get fat and lazy? I said, that's not my nature. Uh, so what are you going to do? I said, well, you know, American businesses are largely absent from Africa. And if anyone's paying attention to what's happening in the world, Africa is the next El Dorado. And I don't mean that from a standpoint that it's a place for us to go exploit. But what I mean is it's a place where Africans can profit and Americans can profit. Jobs can be created. Trade can be increased because there's so little of it. And by 2050, there'll be 2.3 to 2.5 billion Africans, even with people leaving the continent, going to China and to Latin America, North America, and Europe, there'll still be 2.3 billion Africans, at least in Africa. Someone's going to take advantage of that market, whether you want to sell mobile phones or apps or clothing or shoes or food, whatever you want to sell. American business is largely uh, limited to the big corporations like Caterpillar, John Deere, uh, and um, and also Microsoft, Google, Apple, those sorts of things. You don't see Verizon. You probably never even heard of Verizon living in Africa. It's one of the largest telecommunication companies in the world. Comcast, the largest. It's here in the United States. They're missing out on such wonderful opportunities to make money and to create jobs and to benefit Africans and Americans. So I said, let me start a, um, a, uh, a consultancy and I'll make my services available to try to prophesize Africa for Americans. Because most people outside Africa look and go, oh, the three C's that I call it, uh, C-cube, chaos, corruption, and coup d'etat. I call that C-cube, chaos, corruption, and coup d'etat. Now, 
No doubt all three of those exist in Africa. There's 54 countries. And no doubt some countries are more prone to those things. But Africa in 2021, and well, let's go back before the pandemic, but Africa in 2020 is not Africa in 2000. It's not Africa in 1970, 1960. Things have changed dramatically and, and oftentimes for the better. So I wanted to prophesize to get businesses out there. And if I get to travel to Africa, that's fantastic. And I can make a little bit of money. That's even better. Unfortunately for me, uh, well, back to the name. So Indaba is a Zulu and a Koso word, which means uh, a gathering uh, to, for consultations, uh, usually of seniors and elders to discuss something very important. I needed a word for Africa that people in Africa would get. And since my first love of Africa is Southern Africa, and that's where my affinity is, it was natural for me to find a word from a language in that region. And I wanted to make sure it was a word that didn't have too many syllables that Americans couldn't pronounce <laughs> or Brits couldn't pronounce. So Indaba seemed perfect. I have a consultancy. This is a, a gathering to discuss important issues. And so I created Indaba Africa Group, a strategic consultancy to be a consultancy. Unfortunately for me, uh, after I came back from the Rugby World Cup, where I wrote 12 articles, which were published during the World Cup, mostly um, human interest pieces about how the Japanese are doing such a great job, and also the experience of being there. I spent a month in Japan. So I came back from that, and um, I started prepping for everything. I took a little bit of time off. My mother, who had cancer, I went to visit her. She lived in another state. So, uh, and then I came back, and I started prepping everything, because, you know, starting a business can be a little complicated, even in America. In Botswana, it's easy. You file a piece of paper, and, you know, three days later, you get a business, but not so easy in America. So I started uh, putting that all together and I booked several things. People, because of my reputation, because I'm known out there, people are like, yeah, we'd like to come talk. Also, um, one of the things I did my last three or four years in the army since I was at the war college is that I was very frequently requested to be a speaker. And I speak on lots of topics, whether just give an example, some of the things I spoke in my last year in the army. I went to Denver twice to talk about alternative energy and, and China and the energy sector in Africa, because I have experience in the energy sector. I went to Chicago to talk about uh, the rebuilding the Armed Force Library, which is a program I led. I was in Chicago to talk about US trade with Africa on another conference. And then I went to London to talk about repatriating Desh fighters, the ISIS fighters, their spouses and their children, which is a complicated topic. So that's just a handful of the things I did my last year. So the consultancy was also if someone wanted me to speak on a topic or hire me to do something. So that was the idea. Well, I started booking gigs because of my reputation and I had actually, it was pretty lucrative. Uh, of course, I never received any of that because it didn't happen, but it was scheduled for April and May of last year. And then March comes along and boom, lockdown, and everybody loses their mind and they cancel everything. So now I have no consultancy gigs. Well, I don't want to sit around here and eat, you know, and just eat bill tongue and, you know, drink beer and get lazy and fat. So I had to do something. And since people were huddled up like hermits in their houses and can't go anywhere, I looked at what's happening in South Africa where the lockdown was draconian. People couldn't leave their homes without risk of being arrested simply for leaving their home. And my concern, honestly, this is the truth. My concern was since I have time in my hands and people were already showing some interest in my, my channel, which was small at the time on YouTube. I, I had two subscribers in February last year when I started, although it was 16 years old, the channel, two subscribers. Um, as an intelligence officer, I couldn't be posting videos there, but I'm no longer serving. So, so two, two subscribers last year. And then people started latching on to these short videos I was doing on strategic issues across Africa. And they asked me to start live stream. I started live streaming and the audience started growing pretty rapidly. And so as a consequence of the audience growing pretty rapidly, um, I started focusing on that. Uh, and so that became the focus and I turned it into a broadcasting. I went from two subscribers in February to 1,000 by the end of May. I had less than 500 at the beginning of May. And from May, June 1st until December 1st, I went to 21,000 subscribers, um, plus uh, 250 paying members of the channel were supporting the channel, you know, freely. And uh, people were asking me for merchandise store. I started that sort of thing. But the interesting thing about this is not all that. Um, the interesting thing is I was censored. YouTube took my channel away on false claims that I said things I never said. Uh, and they're not good actors. It's a shame. But, uh, but the really interesting thing about this is that that turned into so many other things. As a consequence of the interviews, the people I met, and, and I'll interview anyone that I think might be of interest to people. I've interviewed the CEO of the Macadamia Nut Growers Association of South Africa, the CEO of the Restaurants Association of South Africa, a small-scale uh, commercial farmer in Ghana, a security analyst in Ghana, a banking expert from Ghana and who lives in the U.S., a Nigerian-American who's a businesswoman, Steve Hofmeyer, you know, Dr. Corne Mulder, the list goes on and on. I mean, from all walks of life, I'm happy to interview them because somebody will have interest in it. And so um, I, because of that, I ironically wound up being involved in all sorts of other activities. For instance, I'm now a music promoter. I am involved in bringing Ösch die Dritten, which is the most famous Swiss yodeling group from Switzerland to South Africa and possibly Namibia in early 2022. 
I've also linked up some South African performers with uh, producers and uh, promoters whom they didn't know to help them promote the music. I've been promoting Giselle's music, who's from Namibia. She's from Rootfontein, and she's uh, she lives in in uh, in, um, in South Africa now, but she's a musician, sings in Afrikaans and in country in English. And uh, Trevor Donjane, he used to be the bass player for Johnny Clegg for 13 years or so. Uh, he just had an album out, so I've been promoting that. And uh, so it's been interesting. I've, I wanted the music promotion business and uh, and and some other things have, have come about as a consequence of that. So the, the YouTube thing uh, really uh, opened a lot of doors, which wasn't the intent. I fold all of them kind of into my consultancy and just provide services to people all over. I'm not sure I answered your question. That was a long answer. <laughs> no, you did. Um, but you've been involved in a lot of different sectors and of course, here at Jobs for Africa, we're extremely concerned with the empowering the youth and that sort of thing. So I would like to know, what opportunities do you see for the youth in Africa? Well, first off, uh, uh, just a full disclosure, I'll tell you that I really detest that word empowering. I hate when people use that. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's overused. And, and I think it's, um, from my perspective, it's an excuse used that people use. I, I know people mean well with it. But uh, you don't need to empower anybody. You simply need to let them loose, open doors, and make sure that people can see what's there for them. Empowering them implies that you're, you're, you're carrying someone, to me anyway, you're carrying them along. But along that way, um, so the question was, uh, what, what opportunities do I see? Well, I see endless opportunities, but, but there are several roadblocks in Africa. Now, obviously, you're going to hear all the time, infrastructure is a roadblock. Sure, but people can overcome infrastructure shortfalls. One example of this is Africa for decades, its economic progress was retarded and held back because there was no telephone system for most Africans. The plain old television system, which we call POTS, I used to be in communications as well when I was enlisted. Uh, POTS is what we call telephone, the, the landlines. Uh, that system was limited to major cities and coastlines and capitals. I mean, most people in Africa never picked up a telephone in their life. But then along came GSM in the 1990s and Africa leapfrogged that entire process of running landlines, which are incredibly expensive and uh, difficult to maintain and, and, and quite costly. So you can overcome infrastructure. Uh, now, some infrastructure you can't overcome. I mean, if you live on an island and there's no boats, you're, you're kind of stuck, right? <laughs> you got to have boats. But uh, infrastructure is one thing. But I think the bigger challenge for the youth in Africa, honestly, is education. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Now, I had this conversation with Toyo Nusemri, who's a Nigerian-American, um, on, on an interview she did with me a few months back. And uh, a lot of people were listening to it, and they, they'd be like, that's just switched on. You're so on top of it. What I mean by this is I've seen education all over Africa, in Francophone, in Anglophone Africa, in Indigenous languages in Africa, in Western languages in Africa. And my observation is that most of Africa, regardless of where you come from, regardless of the system, African children are taught rope memorization, and they're taught what someone decides they should learn. They're not taught critical thinking by and large, and they're not taught to expand their horizons. And that's if kids are even taught. But beyond that, even bigger concern for me is that so many girls are denied education in Africa. It's off the charts how few girls in many parts of Africa ever get the opportunity to educate. And that causes all kinds of problems. Uh, fertility rates remain stubbornly high in countries where girls don't get education. We found around the world over the past six decades that the higher level of education girls get, the lower fertility rates are. That's just, it, it's, it's indisputable. And whether it's in Asia, micro, uh, in the Pacific, or it's in Africa, it doesn't matter where it's at. The higher education level you get girls to, whether it's through primary school, which makes a big difference just getting through primary school, but even middle school and through high school, you dramatically lower fertility rates. Now, I'm not trying to eliminate the human race and stop no fertility reproduce, but my point is that Niger, the reason Niger is so poor is not because of colonialism or, or neocolonialism, although those things had a, a, a big impact. The reason Niger is so poor is that when I was a child, there were 3.6 million people living in Niger. Today, there's 26 million people. It's just as dry. It's the same size. There's no more water. There's no more resources. And now 26 million people are there. I worked at the American Embassy there. And one day I talked to my driver and I said, so, cause I always ask people, you know, it's, uh, I like to engage people to find out, you know, cause everybody matters. And that, I think that's really interesting. A lot of people, they, they get a big head about their position, who they are, and they don't engage with people. I always engage with people, whether it's someone mopping the floor or someone serving me at a till or in a restaurant. I always do, because I think everybody has a story. Some are more interesting than others, but everybody has a story. So I asked him, I said, so how about his family? He goes, oh, yeah, no, my dad, uh, I'm one of 38 children my father had. 38 children? Oh, okay. Do you think that might be one of the reasons why nobody has any money in this country? 
who can support 38 children? That's insane. Anyway, my point is that um, education lowers fertility rate, which gives Africa a better chance. And then beyond that, you got to have real education. I see in South Africa, the, 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 the basic education ministry now is talking about, we're going to have mandatory coding and robotics in classes. This is the same country where small children in primary school die in pit latrines because they haven't built um, abolition units and they don't have permanent classrooms. Uh, this is a serious problem. Kids all over the continent are learning by candlelight still, even in this day. And they're, they're learning with um, resources that are not there. This after decades of aid from out external partners and from countries trying to improve it. I think the biggest thing holding African youth back is proper education. What am I meaning is that skills that you need to succeed in life, not, not someone you know telling you to do this by rote memorization. That's not learning. Well, it is learning, but it's not education, I should say. And I think that's the biggest challenge. Beyond that, the governance of countries, that's the third thing. So infrastructure, education, and governance. Governance is a major issue. South Africa has some serious challenges now because they're, frankly, I don't mean to insult people, but their legislation is racist. They, they, uh, they have uh, black economic, broad-based black economic empowerment, which denies government contracts to people based on their skin pigmentation. During apartheid, we call that racism. I don't know why no one else is calling that racism today. So when you deny opportunity to people simply based on their immutable factors, like their skin color, um, you can't help but wonder where people's intentions are. Uh, their intent is to uplift black South Africans, but it's having the opposite effect. It's discouraging entrepreneurship, and it is preventing things from happening. And I suppose if you want to throw one final thing in there, most of these things affect everyone, not just the youth, except for the education, because presumably adults are done learning, but we always learn. And the last one is corruption. The corruption is really something bad. It doesn't matter how well educated you are as a young woman in Africa and how many skills you have. If the only way you get a job in a company or in a, in a ministry and government to be appointed there is if you uh, trade sexual favors with someone who has a position of power, then your life is not going to be what it can be. And the reality is that is truth. Uh, look all over Africa. I can point to country after country where women are forced, even married women are forced to have sexual relationships with vile, disgusting people who hold power over them or they lose their job and their income and their family suffers. That's something that Africa needs to fix. Now, it's not everywhere, but it is prevalent. Um, I hope those things answer the question. Yeah, just to also latch on to education, as you said, the education system getting in robotics and stuff in South Africa isn't really making sense. So what would you say needs to change in the education system to make it more realistic to the average African person? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so first off, I, I think that kids need to be taught to think, to think critically. You know, uh, in South Africa, we've had this whole, we've had the, uh, I don't mean to focus on South Africa, but it's a microcosm of, of what's happening in much of the continent. So South Africa's had this completely backwards movement in education. Well, let's be honest, education, Bantu education for most Black South Africans was not up to scratch during apartheid. That's just the truth. Uh, whether people want to deny it or not, it's the truth. And it simply wasn't sufficient. It was teaching kids basic skills so they could do minimal things and have minimal literacy so they could perform minor functions, you know, and not not actually excel and become, you know, you know, Elon Musk, that that wasn't the intent for black South Africans, um, or colors or Indians for the most part. But the, the bottom line with, um, with it is that um, education South Africa has gone backwards. Arguably, education today is worse than it was under apartheid. At least under apartheid, most white kids in South Africa got a decent, if not exceptional education. Now, that wasn't fair that they alone, for the most part, got it, but that was good. And some blacks and some colors got decent educations, depending on circumstances. But today, the, the South Africans have ruined the entire system, the ANC. Now, they continually lower the standards. Do you know that in South Africa, in order to pass the matrix to get into university, you only have to score 30% in two of your subjects? 30%. Who in their right mind thinks that 30% is a passing grade? That's absolute insanity. Instead of improving education, they've lowered the standards. And what we get is we get students who go to university who are functionally illiterate, who can't do basic mathematical skills, but they got 30% on the test. And they go and they start campaigns torching schools and fees must fall and distorting history and things like that. It's very disturbing. So what should kids learn? Well, they should learn literacy, ideally in their first language, but also they should learn a second language from the get-go. Now, that sounds kind of some people go, you're an American, that's hypocritical. All they learned is English in America. Well, I speak six languages. Three of them are African um, because I wanted to. Uh, you don't have to speak another language in America because there's no need to. Uh, America was isolated from the world for a long time and everything was here. And, and anyway, so the point is that, uh, so my, me saying that the kids should learn two languages going through school is not hypocritical. I just want, that's the point I want to make. My recommendation for countries in Africa is kids learn their first language and then they should learn normally, I would say in English. 
uh, but um, they could also learn French or even these days learn Mandarin. Uh, although I hope most of them don't learn Mandarin, but but it's but it's 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 a it's a viable option. The point is you have to have a language that's international. The reason for English, I say English is because English is language of the internet. Even with you know 600 million Chinese in the internet, it's still English. English is language of aviation. Pilots talk to each other in towers around the world in English. English is language of commerce, of trade, of science. If you go back a century ago, virtually all scientific papers in chemistry, physics, and astronomy were written in German because Germany was where the, the center of, of, of that sort of education was. And people from around the world, if they wanted their papers published, they would learn German. If they were English and they were writing about chemistry, they would write their paper in German. Same with Americans. Well, that's not the case now. 85, 90% of all academic papers around the world are written in English these days, whatever the field is. And so, so my argument is African kids should learn English. Now, some people will take offense to that. I'm not saying it should supplant their first language, but it should be something they learn because it's, it's a trade you can use around the world. If you're functional in English, you know, it's sad because uh, ironically, uh, our system here in the States, it's not really a system. It's a bunch of systems for education. But basically, if we call it education system, uh, a lot of kids here in this country are not even as literate as some kids from private school in Nigeria who get really good education because they focus on English and they're very literate. But uh, I think that um, basic literacy is a critical skill. And then once you have basic literacy, teaching teaching critical thinking where, where kids are not critical, not criticizing, but, you know, picking apart things. So for instance, uh, people talk about, um, I just saw this this week, uh, Janet Yellen, the um, treasury secretary of the United States, who was our uh, central bank uh, governor recently. She is now arguing that all oh, 40 million Africans have been pushed into poverty because of COVID. We need debt relief. Okay. Um, so it doesn't, you know, a lot of people hear that and go, oh, poor Africans, they need debt relief. Well, first off, from me personally, I think it's very insulting to think that Africans have no agency and they're just naive little waifs who just need someone to bail them out all the time. What's really going on here is governments are trying to get off the hook for money they borrowed, and it's not the first time. And let me explain. A little bit of critical thinking like this is how you teach kids to think about this. Okay, first off, the pandemic. So did anybody call for debt relief um, after the pandemic started? Yes, yes. Dozens of African finance ministers met last year in Addis in February before the pandemic even hit Africa and demanded, didn't ask for it, demanded debt relief. They said, we need debt relief. Well, why do you need debt relief? You, your, your economies haven't been, now they will be affected most likely, but they haven't been. So that's when it started already. Now, the other piece of this is countries like Ghana are leading the charge. We need debt relief. Well, Ghana just issued $3.2 billion in euro bonds. So they're issuing more debt while asking for debt relief. Wait a second here. Now, now, see, a lot of people just go and they march right along with this, but critical thinking would make, you know, make young Africans go, wait a second, there's something wrong with this picture here. Or the simple thing like South Africa. Why is it right for someone to say that the majority of South Africa's population, which has all been born after apartheid, should be held accountable for the sins of people who aren't around anymore? Some still are. Well, why are young South African born today? Why should they be denied a contract with the government if they offer a better service at a better price, more reliable, but they don't qualify because of their skin color? Doesn't that seem strange? But millions of people go, oh, no, it's right because historical injustices. No, it's not right. Anyway, the point is critical thinking, mathematics, of course, the things you're talking about, coding and robotics, absolutely. But when you have kids who get 30% in math, that's not who I want building my bridge across, across the Orange River. I don't want someone that got 34% in math being a structural engineer who builds a high rise in Vindhoek. That is not a hotel I want to stay in. I'll watch it collapse. While I sit and drink a Vintok lager sitting in a cafe somewhere, I'll watch the building collapse, but I'm not going to go to a building that um, a structural engineer got 35, 40% in their math skills. And that's pretty scary. Um, so th th those are the things that uh, I think should be focused on, but um, for a lot of reasons, they're not across the continent. And it's unfortunate. And would you say that taking some young Africans back to blue collar jobs rather than white collar jobs is also a viable option in your opinion? Well, that's an interesting conversation. Thank you for that, Christine. So here in America, we have this guy called Mike Rowe, who is from Baltimore. I'm actually from Baltimore myself originally, um, not too far from where I'm sitting now. Uh, Mike Rowe is a very famous television personality. He does all these shows. He's got this amazing voice. It's just really good, Mike Rowe. You, you, in America, people recognize his voice instantly. He started this program several years ago called Dirty Jobs about blue collar jobs. And his point was that in America, we've got this, and, and it's the same in Africa and around the world, we have this fantasy in our head that you're not a success unless you've gone to university. Well, that's nonsense, that's utter nonsense. Uh, I know people who've never gone to university are incredibly successful. 
and people who failed university like Bill Gates are incredibly successful. Now, I don't know Bill Gates personally, but you get my point. Uh, but uh, the point is, is that university um, opens doors and it's limited to a very tiny section of homo sapiens. Humanity, less than 1% of humans ever get to attend university and even fewer successfully completed. So university should not be the ideal except for certain specific career fields where we need people to be qualified in things. There's nothing wrong with blue collar jobs. We have jobs here, blue collar jobs to pay two, three, four, five times as much as someone with a PhD. For instance, uh, um, HVAC, the, uh, the, the, the high voltage um, electrical current, which uh, they, they fix electrical systems. Some of those people make two, three hundred thousand dollars per year here in the U.S., and the jobs are going wanting because people, we all have to go to college. We have to have a degree in gender studies and history. And no, you don't. You don't. Some people need that, but not everybody needs that. In our case, it's a consequence of the Second World War. After the war, 18 million American men came back from the military. 15 million in the army. Can you imagine that? 15 million. There's only two, three million people in, in Namibia. <laughs> but uh, 15 million people, men came back from the army, 3 million from the Navy came back. And they had to go back in the workforce. They displaced a lot of women who filled their roles while they were gone. But a lot of them which just would have been sitting around with veterans who had combat experience. You don't want people like that sitting around with nothing to do, like South Africa in 1994. So what do you do? Well, you make education available and open up the doors and greatly expand the secondary or the tertiary education system. So universities grew like crazy. And of course, that creates jobs in universities. It creates more research and ostensibly get better. But it created an expectation in America that in order to make it, you have to be a university graduate. And I think that that's, that's a misnomer. In Africa, we need plumbers everywhere. My goodness, we need plumbers, we need electricians, we need carpenters, we need, we need masons, we need, we need all the people with these skills. And a lot of these jobs can pay a lot of money. Can you imagine being somebody that runs fiber optics in Namibia to put in, you know, to put in network lines? That could pay a lot of money. It takes skill. Fiber optic jobs, those guys sit with those headsets and those, those magnifying glasses and they have to connect that fiber optic. You can't just walk in there and jam it together. You got to have skills. So I think, in fact, that Africans ought to be focused on both blue collar and white collar jobs. If you if you think that the only way to get ahead is to have a white collar job, then I think your head's screwed on backwards because the world needs labor from all sorts of people. Now, the next question before we get to this, people are going, well, what about robotics? Well, we're a long way off from robotics taking jobs out of Africa. Trust me, uh, a long way off. But I, I think in the future, we need to focus on both blue collar and white collar. I agree with that one. Um, so the next question I have is actually a free part question. No, no, does, does, kind does that, of goes into. Does that mean you don't agree with everything else I said before that? <laughs> you said you agree with that one. <laughs> Most of it. <laughs> but um, the next question I have is a free part question, which actually also kind of fits into the digital divide caused by COVID-19 and education. But more so, so you have a lot of experience in the health sector and especially in HIV, AIDS, Ebola, Morocco and malaria and tuberculosis. But I would just like to ask, what would you say is the effect of these diseases on the youth and employment? What strategies can be applied to combat these effects? And how do you think these solutions can be applied to a post COVID-19 Africa? Are we talking about all those disease, disease in general or, or before COVID or with COVID? Uh... No, more so you've had experience with the effect of these diseases. Yes. So you know what strategies work also to combat the effects yeah. of these diseases on the youth. How can these effects be or the strategies be applied to COVID? Absolutely. Well, again, information education is key and good information is key. So we saw that uh, with HIV, unfortunately, stigma came with the advent of HIV and stigma was devastating. It paralyzed people. People would rather not know their status, whether they're positive or not then find out because their stigma attached to it. They'd be ostracized, they'd be, they'd be separated, they wouldn't have opportunity, people would mistreat them. It's, it's really horrific the way humans behave uh, when they're uninformed. And that was the case with HIV early on. So the key with HIV was education. I mean, early in the early days, I mean, Dr. Fauci here in the States was telling people that children were giving it to, to others. They, they weren't giving HIV to people. I mean, no children were having anal sex with, uh, with adults, you know, passing the disease along. Children six years of age aren't in, in, by norm entering as drug users or, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, he and others were wildly off the mark about what HIV was and how it worked in the early days of it. But education is critically important because with education, youth can be informed about how to protect themselves and what they need to do. Now, in Africa, we turned the tide against HIV with education. Uh, and it also helped overcome the stigma. When people discover that you can't get HIV from drinking from the same well as somebody that's got it, 
that was a huge, huge impact on improving things. When kids learn that when you become sexually active, that it's smart to try ABC, you know, either abstain, uh, be faithful, condomize, or all three of those things, it made a huge impact. Now, a lot of people argued against that, a lot of people who were, I don't know how to, without saying this in the rude manner, but a lot of people, a lot of people are against ABC saying it didn't work. But um, the reality is that different aspects of that work, but educating people about these things is really made the biggest difference. When it comes to other infectious diseases, which have a debilitating effect, I mean, malaria still crushes Africa, especially children. The vast majority of people who die from malaria are under the age of five, and they're in Africa from malaria every year. And that's unfortunate. But a lot of that's wholly unnecessary. I lived in Liberia, and we would lose 15 to 20 percent of our workforce every single day throughout the year because they were home sick with malaria. So we hired more workers than we needed because we would never have the workers we needed. Now, that's insane. That's also highly inefficient. And if you're a company trying to make money, now you've got to carry 20 percent more workforce. So that impacts your profits and the price of your goods, which makes you less competitive. But um, so with Liberia, the situation I want to mention here is that malaria was rife, <laughs> me, but it didn't have to be. So if you know a little bit about malaria and the anisophily, and I can't pronounce the word, it's Latin, but the, the, that type of mosquito that spreads malaria, the parasite, then you know that they breed in stayed water, in, 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 in stationary water. And if you have rubbish laying around like tin cans and plastic containers sitting there and a little pool of water forms, it's a perfect place for them to lay their eggs and for mosquitoes to breed. If you simply pick up the rubbish and live in a clean fashion, you can dramatically reduce the case of malaria. In communities where we've seen people take responsibility for their community and just pick things up because people told them this is how it's transmitted, we've seen dramatic drops in malaria. And that greatly improves the chances of children get past the age of five. I mean, once you get past the age of five, most people will survive most malaria cases. So, that, so again, it's education information. That makes all the difference in the world. The problem is that, is that there's no mention or focus on this in most communities in Africa. Now, maybe a couple hundred years ago in traditional communities, you know, like the San and the Kalahari, they know what would affect, the, you know, tell their kids not to go here, not to do that, and maybe other communities. But in the modern world, we've lost that connection in nature in many respects, and people don't respect nature, and they ignore it, or they ignore their environment. And, and so I think information education is a key role for the youth so that they understand what the dangers are out there. If you understand, like, for instance, you know, you shouldn't be wading in um, freshwater creeks in certain parts of Africa. Don't be standing around in them. Why? Because bilharzia is from there, schistosomiasis, which is a nasty little worm that burrows into your legs and your skin and reproduces, and it causes debilitating, painful injuries and can lead to amputations in some cases. But it's easily avoidable. Either wear, you know, wear Wellingtons, rubbers, you know, so they don't get it on your feet that way, or simply don't stand in these creeks. And if you have to because you're fishing or something like that, then you wear protective stuff. If you don't have protective stuff, then you find some way to just, my point is that information education makes all the difference in reducing much of our infectious diseases unnecessary. I mean, take a look at the past year. Uh, how many cases of influenza are there? Last year, the United States Centers for Disease Control predicted 34 to 42 million cases of influenza, which is not unusual in a country of 300 million. That's the norm. Excuse me. But I've looked at the data from the CDC. Shockingly, there are only 1,750 cases of influenza reported last year, not 34 million. Now, how did that happen? Either there's something strange going on and fictional with COVID, which I'm not going to make that claim, or maybe the fact that people stayed as hermits in their homes and didn't interact in closed spaces where they coughed and exchanged air, sneezed and spread a disease had a major impact on stopping influenza for at least one season. The point is that uh, people have to understand. I, um, just one more thing on, on this, and so it makes sense to you. I went to a hockey game recently, ice hockey, and I was walking through the parking lot. I was parked in, in a VIP section, which is usually closed, but since it was limited seating, they just opened up. I'm like, hey, I'll take advantage of that. So I parked in the VIP section, and I'm walking up. I'm not wearing a mask. I'm 150 meters away from anybody else, and I see people going, ew, ew, oh, it's typhoid Mary. Look at that lunatic not wearing a mask. I could just, yeah, I knew what they were saying. Um, those aren't verbatim quotes. So as I approached the building, got close to people, I put my mask on because it's a requirement. When I stood in front of the door, there are several doors to enter the building. They have screening inside with um, metal detectors and all that. So I stood about 10 feet, about three meters behind the person in front of me because there's no rush. There's no need to be closer, uh, even though the person was facing four. As I walk up, I watch all these people who were like, ew, like that towards me, all grabbing the door with their hands, touching the same door handle the people in front of them touched, walking in, taking their, their wallet and their keys, putting it in a little plastic bin, grabbing the bin that everyone else has touched, and they walk in. Now, these are the same people that were just looking at me like I'm some kind of typhoid Mary because I'm not wearing a mask 150 meters away when the distance that a cough travels is about 15 feet and a sneeze 24 feet. 
So, so these people are touching likely infected surfaces, spreading a disease because they're morons. They're not well educated about how, how disease is spread. My point is that um, people need to have information that's valuable and useful, and it's the same for kids. And the healthier a kid is, the stronger they'll be, the better chance they have at learning and becoming productive in society. Okay, but would you say that um, because of these illnesses, um, for example, if somebody got tuberculosis, they may have missed maybe a term of schoolwork. To pick it up, were there any procedures put in place in order to combat the education that they missed? Oh, historically, no. Historically, that that's usually people just miss things. I mean, kids were sick with HIV before we had antiretrovirals. They just were home and didn't get educated. But there is some hope now. And, and I think perversely, because of the, the COVID pandemic, we've probably opened up a lot of eyes for people. Now, for me, I've had a very unusual experience when it comes to education uh, at a university. So for instance, university, I went to university in residence when I was a freshman. Then I was in the army and I went to university classes at night, a couple nights a week to further my degree, which is pretty tough to do because uh, you go for hours on end, not just an hour and leave. Uh, and then I also did like full weekends. I spent a whole weekend, eight hours a day, two days in a row to get credit for. And I also took examinations. We have these, these, these qualification tests. You can, you can uh, get exempted from a certain course to get a certain score. So I did that as well. I also did correspondence where I applied to UNISA and took classes with UNISA and also took classes here in the States, university classes. And then I was involved in the early days just by happenstance when I was in Iowa, they had something called the Iowa Community Network. And the Iowa Community Network was the early days of distance education. We were taught in person at our course in where, they, where the university was based in Ames, Iowa, but there were branch campuses around the state where people in their communities would go to a place that had like a Zoom-like function. They would, you know, it was a, a video teleconference back in 1995. <laughs> we were doing this. Yeah, exactly. And so I was in the early days of that. Then I've also... Uh, did distance education. I earned, uh, I've worked three master's programs and, 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 and one of them was, or two of them were distance education, one was resident. So I've done all these different things. So what I'm getting at is that I have a unique perspective on education too, because I've, I've, I've learned in all these fashions and some work, some don't, some are better suited for different learners at different stages. Um, but the one positive impact, if I could say about this when it comes to education, is that for those who didn't realize it, now their eyes are open. They realize that just because a child is sick doesn't mean they can't participate in education. I mean, if you have children who have tuberculosis or infectious and are at home, now, obviously, if you live in Niger, your chances of this can be greatly reduced. But if you live, say, in Vintok or you live in, uh, you live in Habarone or you live in uh, Abuja, your chances of doing this are better because you're likely to have some connectivity, either through a mobile device or through an internet, a PC or something like that. But now we, we have the opportunity to include those learners in a class by joining a Zoom session or, or, you know, or WebEx or something like that, or Microsoft Teams, and they can participate in the process. I think going forward for those educators who open their eyes and are really concerned about the youth getting an education, particularly those who've, who've been impacted by disease. I mean, there's also kids who suffer from cancer, unfortunately, and they're out of school for months, if not a year or more at a time. And many of these kids survive their cancer, but then they're so far behind their peers. Well, this is a way now, obviously not when they're very sick, they can't participate, but this is a way to allow kids to continue their education. And it's not ideal. It never is. I mean, the best way to learn is in person with someone where you can interact, you can read the emotions on their face, you can read their facial expressions, and you can get that. That's the best way to do it. But I think that going forward, because of COVID, uh, we are going to now, now I, 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 I pray and I hope that nobody thinks that that distance education through, through Zoom or WebEx or Teams is an appropriate replacement for in-person learning. It's not, it simply is not. Take it from someone that's done every possible form of education all around the world, it is not. Uh, and you know, like for, for me, for doing distance education programs, those master's programs, that's something well suited to someone who's mature, someone who's educated, someone who has discipline, who can devote time and resource to do that because it's very easy to fall behind distance education. Doing that with a six-year-old is an abject failure. Doing that with a 12-year-old is an abject failure. So my point is that in a case where it has to happen, kids suffering tuberculosis or cancer or HIV or sick with malaria, then they can at least keep up with their peers um, to some degree. So I think that's, I think it's hopeful. And the better, the better we get more bandwidth, the more capacity across Africa, which is increasing all the time, uh, the better off I think uh, youth in Africa will be. Okay, perfect. And if you were to give one last bit of advice to the youth in Africa, what would it be? Oh, okay. Well, that's a tough one because <laughs> I got lots of advice for youth in Africa. Uh, I would say the thing that really you should focus on is, is, is not what other people say you are or what you can be. 
Don't listen to that. Be who you want to be. There's nothing that should hold you back. Now there are governance structures and there are, there's corruption and there's jealous people and things like that, but anybody can be anything. Listen, I mean, when I was in high school, we had no electricity. We had no plumbing. I fetch water from a cistern and do that in the winter time when it's minus zero and you're walking down a hill spilling water on your jeans and it freezes to your leg. True story. Uh, we had no plumbing. I used an, uh, an outdoor privy, as you guys would call it, or we call it an outhouse to go to the bathroom. Try that, sitting down to go to the bathroom when it's minus zero. That's not a pleasant experience. Uh, and and I, I went from that to where I have had a very productive and wonderful and event-filled life where I've had consequential things that I've done for people all over. I mean, I, I got to write a intelligence report for the president of the United States that saved 640,000 people in Southern Africa from starving to death. How cool is that? I mean, think about that. And, and, and when people told me you couldn't do this, you can't do this, I, I would ignore them. And that's my advice for African youth. Um, now, everyone has different circumstances. I grew up in America. Poverty in America is not poverty in Bangladesh. It's not poverty in Benin. Now, I'm not trying to make that comparison. Uh, but my point is that when people try to stop you, if you want to do something, reassess, take a look at it. I mean, honestly, my career in the military, I rose to the highest rank I could, which was a full colonel. And all along the way, I did the things that you weren't supposed to do. Not, not wrong things, but uh, the career path. I did the things that, well, you won't get promoted if you do that. But I got promoted anyway because of my performance and my dedication, my commitment. It paid off. Now, it doesn't always pay off for us. I've been in a few positions where even if you're the best and shiniest diamond in the room, uh, someone else is going to get the nod. But don't let that discourage you. Don't let others hold you back. You can be what you want to be. And, and, and whether you're a young girl in Niger, or you're a young man in South Africa who happens to be Kosa uh, or happens to be Afrikaans speaking. Don't let other people hold you back. Don't let other people define you. Your life is your life. And unless you believe in reincarnation or the afterlife, this is your one shot at it. Make the most of it and take care of yourself and others around you. And that's my advice. Thank you very much. It was very interesting hearing your opinions and I'm sure it will benefit many people in the future as well. Well, I hope so. <laughs> okay. And have a lovely day. All right. Thank you. Let me stop recording here.